Welcome to today's webinar, Using Scenarios for Effective Planning, hosted by the Smart Growth Information Clearinghouse. My name is Michael Bayer. I am the Manager of Infrastructure and Development at the Maryland Department of Planning and Project Manager for the Smart Growth Information Clearinghouse. The Smart Growth, Smart Growth Information Clearinghouse is a project of the Smart Growth Network and is partially funded by the US EPA, Offices of Community Revitalization, and is managed by the Maryland Department of Planning. In addition to hosting webinars, the Smart Growth Information Clearinghouse has a website, smartgrowth.org, that serves as your one stop on the web for the most current information on effective growth, development, and preservation practices. We provide news and information about events, funding opportunities, awards, and resources to help local decision makers foster healthy, resilient, and economically vibrant communities. The Clearinghouse is also the virtual home of the Smart Growth Network, a nationally recognized coalition of leadership organizations that have formally endorsed the principles of Smart Growth. This webinar is one in a series of webinars produced by the Clearinghouse on Smart Growth topics available for viewing at smartgrowth.org. We are recording this webinar and will post it on our website in the next few days under the Webinar Archives tab. We encourage you to visit the website and subscribe to our e-newsletter to get the latest news and information about smart growth and to learn about our upcoming webinars. You can also find out about planning initiatives and educational opportunities in Maryland by visiting the Maryland Department of Planning's website at planning.maryland.gov. Viewers of this live event are eligible to receive one and a half CM credits from the American Planning Association. To log your CM credits, visit the American Planning Association's website at planning.org log into your account and search for the name of today's event, which is Using Scenarios for Effective Planning. You can also search for event number 9185506. This webinar has been approved for 1.5 CM credits for live viewing only. So to get started, today our speaker is Uri Avin. Uri Avin is a research professor at the National Center for Smart Growth at the University of Maryland. Before that, he was a consultant with national planning and design firms for three decades and also served as a county planning director in Maryland for a decade. Ori's many plans across the U.S. include cities, counties, regions, and states. They have been recognized through 10 national and 20 state awards for excellence. Of these, about 18 are explicitly scenario-based. Ori has co-developed several scenario sketch planning tools and has applied many such tools in his work. He was the principal investigator for NH, NCHRP's 2016 report on scenario and sketch planning tools for regional sustainability. He is the author of Using Scenarios to Make Urban Plans in Engaging Our Futures, Effective Planning Practices by Hopkins and Zapata from 2007, and of several articles in APA publications on scenarios. He was a contributor to Emerging Trends in Regional Planning published by APA in January of 2017. He has provided advice to numerous regional agencies on scenario approaches, processes, and tools. Following this presentation, Uri will answer as many questions as time permits. You can submit a question anytime during the presentation by using the questions tool in the control panel located on the right side of your screen. Now I'm going to turn it over to Uri to get us started. Welcome, Uri. Well, good afternoon or good morning, everyone, and thank you for tuning in. Uh, what I'd like to do to kick it off is to get some sense of who is in the listening audience. So on the next slide, there'll be a couple of polling questions which will be displayed in real time. And uh, that'll give me a sense of who you are and what the audience's orientation is. So I'm going to pass it along to the folks at MDP to hit you with the polling questions. Do you see the response, Uri? No, I do not. Okay. Not yet. Do you, do you have it now? 
So it, it shows that 50 or 49% uh, are local government, 39% private or nonprofit, 8% state agency, and 5% regional agency. Okay, great. Thank you. And then <clears throat> what about the next question? Okay, we're launching it now. What is your experience with scenarios? We won't have uh... So now I have the responses up here. 36% uh, never tried them, 31% some experience, 27% beginner, and 6% with lots of experience. Great, that's very helpful. Um, I will adjust my emphasis accordingly. Good, so let's kick into the sequence of my presentation. I'm gonna start off with some definitions and examples of definitions that deal with scenarios. I'm then gonna drill down a little more into exploratory scenario approaches, which tend to be less familiar, but of increasing interest to planners. Then I'll talk about, given these various approaches, when does it make sense to apply an approach in what context? And finally, I'll talk about tools and what kinds of tools are available and appropriate to use for what kinds of situations. What I will not spend much time talking about, <clears throat> at least in my presentation, we can do it in Q&A if you want, but I won't spend a lot of time on indicators. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on public outreach and scenarios. I'm not gonna spend time on scenarios and how they fit within the political process and strategies for planned development and adoption from a political perspective. This is more focused on the technical aspects and the planner aspects, you might say, the in-house aspects of scenario work. So that's the sequence. Let me start off by framing scenarios in the planning world. The matrix is organized by understanding of the future that planners may have from low to high or control over the future from low to high. So if you have high control, let's say you're a local government and you control land use, zoning, planning, and other stuff, including water and sewer, and you have a very clear idea of your future, then probably historically the authoritative comprehensive plan has been your go-to vehicle. At the other end of the spectrum, if you have very little understanding of the future, it's very volatile where you are, and you also have very low control. You may be a regional agency or a small borough or town in the middle of a jurisdiction or an entity that has much more power over the environment than you. In that kind of context, you may be more in, you may be more in the muddling through mode that Lindblom uh, developed back in the 60s when he wrote his um, books on incrementalism. But in between these two extremes, there's a whole world that deals with uncertainty of the future and its control. And that's the world that scenario planning can usefully occupy. Primarily, the fat end of the arrow is in the low understanding of the future, where the future is very, very volatile in your situation. Um, that's where much of this work occurs, but it can also occur where your understanding of the future is relatively solid, but your control is relatively low. So you still want to explore futures beyond one given future or the traditional go for broke planning mode. So that's just a framing of the overall context. Let me move into defining scenarios for the purpose of my presentation. There's several valid approaches and Curious George is scanning the horizon and he sees three kinds of approaches. On the left, we're familiar with predictive where as George peels the bananas, he's pretty sure what he'll find in each banana. These are trends, these are expected futures, these are the probable or baseline futures that are typically generated and are often the point for comparison as you look at other kinds of futures. In the center, 
George is smiling about the prospect of being prescriptive, normative. What's the end state that is desired, preferred? What are the outbound prescriptions or futures that you would like to see happen out there? Very different than in then the mindset on the right hand side, which is called exploratory or contingent, where you're very concerned with uncertainty and with inbound forces that you may or may not be able to control. And you're hoping to define plausible futures, not just desired futures. So that's a three part typology that is frequently used in talking about scenarios. The lines between them are not solid but it's a useful framing of the, of the situation. Let me give you some examples of each of these, starting off with predictive and normative. So here we have a plan for several regional agencies in Florida. And on the left is a 2050 trend projection in which existing land use patterns are simply extrapolated. Maybe policies are also extrapolated maybe rates of growth are extrapolated, but that may be it. Contrasted on the right with where the pink low intensity development that is all over the landscape is now clustered into these high columns or nodes, and you see a significantly expanded open space and green space and farming environment, which is what's called the 2050 vision. And this is fairly typical of the kinds of trend and normative contrasting scenarios that most of us are familiar with and have been practiced, particularly at the regional scale, but even locally um, for several decades. Um, the typical kinds of indicators that are generated in these exercises is shown in this example for the Florida uh, scenarios I just showed you. And here we have seven indicators and typically when the reporting out occurs you're usually between half a dozen and a dozen indicators even though you may be able to generate more um manageable manageability dictates that you want to be under 20 for sure and here we see the current and two alternatives contrasted on a number of indicators which reflect the ability obviously to do some quantitative modeling from a travel model on commuting times, water demand, air quality, and interestingly, economic impact, GDP in billions of dollars in the year 2050, which is a very helpful and important indicator. So this is a typical regional scale application at the local level. Here is Orlando, Florida, where the simplified drawings show you the urban form options that are explored in a scenario framework that is largely normative or prescriptive. These are evaluated and the best performing or most preferred alternative is selected for implementation. So much for this kind of scenario planning that should be familiar to most of you. <clears throat> Either you've done it or you've read about it. And it's summarized in the first diagram that you see, end state planning, where we're testing the effects of transportation and land use, land use alternatives against trends on selected outcomes, the hope being to choose an optimal future. So we've got two on the left of this diagram, two kinds of future formal patterns being put through some gears and cogs being massaged, being evaluated, being discussed. We emerge with a preferred plan, which is then duly documented. Very different than the mindset of exploratory planning, where the inputs are multiple and different. They may not be urban form based at all. They may have to do with, on the left, population and demographic change. They may have to do with economic and fiscal issues. They may have to do with environmental and land use change, which in turn are massaged through some process and then typically construct several alternative futures, all of which may be plausible depending on how they are put together, even though you might prefer the one in the center with a red ring around it, 
you may not be able to get there. The best you might be able to do are select those actions and strategies that will move you in that direction. But your final report may not be one final plan, but a plan that says, here are the things you ought to do for each of these scenarios that are robust and resilient actions, but contingent on what actually happens, there are a whole bunch of sub strategies or sub alternatives you can see in that diagram that may be where you need to go if the world is changing in ways that you did not expect. So that's a framing of the, of the exploratory mode. And let me show you an example that demonstrate that. This is a project called Presto, which is a <clears throat> effort that we at the Center for Smart Growth have been doing for the last four years. And it's called on steroids because it's dependent on numerous coupled models, very quantitative, very elaborate. But in principle, the process is the same as where you don't have some of these supporting tools. So let me show you what Blue Planet looks like. Here are the inputs in red. I'll let you read that. And here's a map of the transit investments that accompany that scenario. And just to orient you, we've got the northeast corner, that's Baltimore, and we've got the southwest ring by circumferential transit, that's Washington, D.C. This is the region being modeled, about six million people. Here are the bottom line impacts of running all these models in words and in a generalized map. I'll let you read that. Okay. So you get the general picture. Here's another scenario, which is called Ashes and Diamonds, and here's its driving assumptions. So you see we're varying things like transportation technology, energy cost, land use controls and interventions. And here's both the transportation map in this case major new beltways around Washington and Baltimore, new connections to the Eastern Shore, and here's the results mapped and described in words. Here's one more. And here, in this case, are something like 13 or more indicators, which are color-coded by scenario, not that you need to look at the details, and show percent change from the business's usual future. So this is typical of the more involved and complex scenario work in exploratory mode that is quantitatively supported. This kind of work can also be done qualitatively through a structured debate and conversation. It doesn't have to be quantitative. Okay, so is all of this useful to anyone? Federal Highways, which has long supported the use of scenarios in transportation planning, has done surveys over time, and from a survey five years ago, here's what they found. Cost-effective, people are likely to use it again, particularly because it engages stakeholders effectively. And then federal legislation was also having an effect because it encouraged the use of scenario work on regional agencies in particular, the hurdles to adopting this approach had to do with funding, staff time, and technical capacity. I would say that in the last five years, these hurdles have reduced and are not 
necessarily as substantial as they used to be. There's a group called the Scenario Consortium that Lincoln Land Institute runs, whose website covers scenario work in many different ways, which is, for those of you interested in it, a very useful website to visit. So, stepping back at this and looking at it comprehensively, Federal Highways has recently published a guidebook that, in effect, combines all three approaches into their six-phase process. So, the six phases are down the left. Each of the gray bars relates on the left to probable or predictive, in the middle, normative or desirable, and on the right, exploratory or contingent. And <clears throat> what this framework does is for each of these approaches, the questions in the rectangular blocks changes. Let's take phase four, which is what could the future look like? In the probable world, your orientation asks about futures that are derived from past trends or other predictive methods. In the prescriptive or de desirable mode, you're asking about futures derived from aspirations, defining the types of futures we want. And finally, in the exploratory mode, you're looking at futures derived from unknowns or threats or hypothetically disruptive conditions. In each case on the right, you're developing alternative futures, but the way you derive them and your thinking is very different depending on the questions you ask. So with all that as a background orienting you, for those of you that in fact have messed with scenarios, which is at least 60% of you, Here's a polling question that we need to get an answer to. Okay, so on the screen now we have your experience with normative scenarios, predictive scenarios, or exploratory scenarios. We'll keep it open for a couple seconds here. Okay, so the response here is actually pretty well split here. Normative, 36%, predictive, 32 and exploratory, 32%. Interesting. Great. Okay, so let me then keep going. Um, but before I keep going, and my when I say keep going, I'm really going to begin to drill down mostly on the explorative side. Um, even though 32% of you have worked in that mode, it's the least well understood and in some ways the most complex. But before I go there, let me step back and point out that this whole enterprise of scenario planning represents a fundamental intellectual hubris or chutzpah. Um, Michael Batty, much respected, well-known analyst and planner in London, has just written a new and important book called Inventing Future Cities, in which he makes the following statement in several different places. I'll let you read it. So Batty is not alone in critics who would say that the whole scenario enterprise effectively is a waste of time. Who 30 years ago could have predicted smartphones, autonomous vehicles, robotization of work, and so on and so forth. And pretending that you can predict the future in one way or another is simply pointless. Much of this argument is waged against the background of the reality of the speed at which technological innovation is being taken up and adopted. This is 100 years of different technologies. And starting in 1900, you'll see how slow the uptake of the telephone in that gray line is over time. Contrast the left side of the graph with the right side of the graph, where between 1980 and 2000, 
cell phones, internet, social media, tablets have been taken up within five or 10 years. It's this accelerating speed of disruptive technology that will affect not only our behavior, but also land use. When more than 50% of retail sales are online, what happens to retail stores? So this is the background against which critics of scenario planning argue. In our defense, I think we can say that we have to plan for the future. We have investments to make in roads, transit, sewer, water, you name it. And we've got no choice but to take our best guess. And scenario planning is a useful way of thinking about the medium term and the long term future. And cultivating such a mindset is a useful discipline, it has to be our defense. So let me talk a little more about scenario planning. Basically, I see this as a hierarchy of applications, and the hierarchy is organized along the vertical axis by what I'm saying is the usefulness or the utility of using XSP, which stands for an exploratory scenario planning approach. What do you get out of doing all of this stuff? That's the vertical axis. And along the horizontal axis, I'm gonna give you examples that I'll explore briefly once I'm done with this framework. So here's the hierarchy. At the bottom of its usefulness is, if you do explore your scenario, scenarios, at the very least, you understand your context well. Beyond that, one next step up, you can actually develop useful insights. Beyond that, you can develop robust and contingent strategies. You can even, depending on how you structure your work and your scenarios, you can get consensus on a preferred scenario. Even though I've argued earlier that you really want to focus on a set of actions to move in a certain direction, people can simply say, this is the preferred scenario. We've looked at its implications. This is what we want to do. And finally, at best, doing exploratory scenarios well can provide an overarching framework for a plan. And let me illustrate the first at the bottom by work done by the Atlanta Regional Commission called Winning the Future. Next, I'm gonna focus on Federal Highways Freight Futures work. Next on DVRPC, Philadelphia Regions Connections Study. Next on the Gwinnett County Unified Plan, Northeast of Atlanta, Georgia. And finally, in Florida, in Palm Beach County, the Central Western Community Sector Plan. So those I'm gonna walk through in turn give you a sense of what's involved, how they're made to work, and what some of the applications have been of these examples. So starting off with the Atlanta region. Top left are the key drivers of change. So if you look at that little box with the nine icons, you'll see autonomous vehicles top left. Next to that, major demographic change, aging population, all the stuff you know about, and the top right icon stands for climate change, and so on and so forth. These drivers are analyzed, worked out, and consolidated into four alternate futures that are described in words, tested, and described in numbers so that they can be ran through a set of models that are in that green box with a view to keeping going on the analysis via a range of future models. This process has stopped in the green box and the agency is in the middle of figuring out its next regional transportation plan and regional development plan. The process, because it's automated can generate hundreds of alternative futures, as you see. This is the model being used here, um, part of the Vision Eval suite of tools developed by Oregon DOT. And you'll see that the outputs on the right or the indicators are essentially all driven by a travel demand model. 
So even though the things that might interest us go beyond, well beyond the travel demand models outputs, because of the tools available for this process, the indicators are essentially transportation oriented. The next slide is a spider diagram of sorts where the four scenarios that are identified in the legend on the top right are mapped in terms of how much they achieve or don't achieve targets. So Ecotopia, the yellow, the green diamond does best on these four measures or indicators or criteria or goals. The blue fierce headwinds, which is a negative scenario, does the worst. Again, this is a fairly typical presentation of a sophisticated um, agency's work with exploratory scenarios um, in the last three years. It sets the context for the next series of projects they're going to be doing because they've learned a lot from this analysis. That's as far as it goes. The next example, in fact, takes us up a notch in the hierarchy, and this is the National Cooperative Higher Research Project that looks at future freight flows in a contingent or exploratory process. Here's the standard, most accepted methodology, but not the only one by any means, for how to analyze driving forces out there in the environment. If you want a good documentation of how to do this, the reference that you see below in the slide is the very best one that I've seen. Wonderfully clear, very explicit, gives you tremendous guidance, not only on how to develop them, but how to apply them. So <clears throat> it starts by organizing trends in a specific framework in those five categories deciding which of those trends are going to happen anyway, they're givens, versus those that may or may not happen, they're indeterminate, and then organizing those indeterminate ones by how likely they are and how much impact they will have, which in the final box, together using the highest likelihood and biggest impact indeterminates, together with biggest impact givens, are the grist to the mill for building your scenarios by collecting driving forces in different ways to create a plausible narrative. So this is a rigorous process which does not have to be quantitative. In this case, it was not quantitative. And the scenarios that resulted are these four. And this two by two matrix is frequently seen in these kinds of applications. The driving forces identified as crucial are listed on the left and on the top left of the, of the icon, millions of markets, for example, assumed high resource availability and low global trade. The opposite of bottom right one world order, for example, where low resource availability is assumed and high global trade is assumed. So, you're getting the kind of picture here about the construction of scenarios. What's done with these? In this case, insights are developed through a number of DOTs that deal with future freight, taking these four scenarios and applying them qualitatively to the supply chain imperatives that they have and what might need to change and quantitatively applying them to their projected current investments for freight and then seeing if they work or make sense. This proved to be an enlightening exercise for several of the DOTs who actually changed their investment priorities as a result of thinking about the long-term future of freight. For example, improving east-west connections much more than north-south connections in the case of one DOT. So, so much for developing insights in a rigorous um, exploratory mode. Here's the Greater Philadelphia region's scenarios, which are really driving forces writ large. There are five of them, and I'll let you read through them. 
As with the Atlanta Regional Commission, these scenarios were described quantitatively, were modeled in various ways, but in the end, their use was in trying to identify what actions are universal across all of these outcomes. And these are not modeled spatially. The tools they used did not allow spatial modeling. It's a very large region, so these were generalized impacts. And therefore, the universal actions that apply in all cases as worthy of implementation are fairly general. If you read this list, you'll see these are fairly general kinds of actions needed. But beyond these universal actions, this exercise also looked at contingent actions. If you're moving towards enduring urbanism, those six blue items are the things you want to really focus on doing and investing in. Same with severe climate at the bottom. So this is a partial table of, from the report that obviously expands on all of this, but this is as close an example that I have seen of a process that actually tries to generate robust universal actions and also contingent actions. Again, it's not spatially specific, so the actions are not really very spatially exact, which at the local level you would obviously prefer. Let me move up the hierarchy one more uh, notch and show you the summary of Gwinnett County, which is the white flight, rapidly growing county northeast of Atlanta that grew the fastest in the country for at least two decades, 70s and the 80s. Here are the three scenarios described that were developed. And again, I'll let you read through their characteristics. What the county decision makers chose to do was try and target the international gateway scenario. But because they weren't sure of the future, they also took the middle of the pack scenario through the planning process. So the actual plan that was developed has two futures embedded in it. Both of those scenarios are there. Much more detailed is the international gateway scenario, but they maintain these options going forward. What they chose to ignore in 2007, before the bubble burst, was the regional slowdown scenario, which in retrospect was an unfortunate oversight. So the kinds of analysis that counts in these situations, in particular, is a fiscal analysis. Elected officials will only give planners credibility, I think, if they know who wins and who loses and how it affects the local fiscal context. So very important in this kind of work, I think, is some efforts to model fiscal impacts for political and public credibility. So we enhanced in doing this work, the fiscal model, broke the area into sub areas, sorted out fire and police by sub area, looked at the bottom line. And as you would expect, the international gateway revenues exceed expenditures, regional slowdown, expenditures exceed revenues, all of these Insights were critical to the choices and the preferred scenario that the county adopted. Important too, because of the rapid rate of growth and the very complex interdependent sewer systems was modeling each scenario's sewer impacts because this is a huge capital impact in this particular context. So, all of these actions 
allowed consensus on a preferred scenario. Let me wrap up the hierarchy with talking about the um, Central Western communities. This was the first sector plan done in Florida in the early 2000s. And what's noteworthy here is the explicitness of the values in the narrative. So here I'm violating the first iron rule of good presentations, which is do not show people a lot of text that they have to read through laboriously. So this is one scenario called minimum growth and maximum preservation. This area lies in Palm Beach County, west of the map. Look at the map for one second, is the Everglades in that checkerboard. This is a very large area, 80, 90 square miles. And these blocks of road networks are mega blocks. The blue lines are canals. The trees are large citrus orchards. You'll see a few proposed road networks in dotted black lines and some open space in green within red dots existing commercial. So that's the map. Read the text so you can get a feel for what the voice of this scenario is. Okay, here's another one called modest residential growth with current policies. And you'll see a lot of the green space that was evident in the previous map is now gone. The red blobs are a bit bigger and there's more dotted roads connecting various parts of the network. This is the voice of this scenario. All of the statements in this scenario and the previous one are based on real analysis of trends. Any of these are plausible. The, the, the death of the citrus industry then and in fact now is a plausible future. So again, none of these are implausible. Put together, they present one set of options for the future. Finally, the most text is maximum residential growth with current policies. And here you'll see in the map much more employment and commercial, many more road connections, and a narrative that supports this as the appropriate position to take if you were a stakeholder with this set of values. What I've been at pains to emphasize is the explicit nature of the values built into the scenario construction as opposed to in some of the previous cases, the more technocratic identification of driving forces and change without them being anchored to explicit worldviews that are crucial in allowing elected officials to make choices based on their values or their constituents' values. So the way in which these scenarios get evaluated is through the community in public outreach mode, developing and agreeing on what are the large 
criteria to evaluate them, what are the goals, what are the principles, which are these eight. The operas, oper, oper, <laughs> oper, operationalizing them takes a lot more work. So the objectives under each of the guiding principles in this table shows you how they in fact are measured. So indicator 1.1, population growth percent change from existing condition. In the minimum scenario, it's 8%. In the modest, you grow 61%. In the significant one, you grow 191%. And so on and so forth through the, um, I think, eight or nine, um, eight. Um, criteria, the analysis of impacts is crucial, was crucial in allowing the county for the sector plan to define their preferred plan, which was leaning towards the maximum preservation, minimum growth with some aspects of other plans or other scenarios embedded as well. And in the sense of a process that led to a plan adoption, I think is a success. So stepping back, what we've in particular in the last case been describing in detail is presented here conceptually. The top two boxes are technical analysis of problems and trends which generate possible futures of givens and indeterminates out there in the world. The bottom two boxes are in reach, if you will, that's your visioning component where you begin to focus on constituent and stakeholder values and attitudes and their desired futures. It is the precise and careful construction and integration of possible futures and desired futures that are compatible that create good and useful scenarios. Scenarios have effects which can be modeled or can be estimated and those effects can lead to interventions to mitigate or modify those effects which in turn can be run through the scenarios. So that's the cycle, if you will, of a fully blown process that I've illustrated in some examples. Let me summarize lessons learned and guidance. So what I'm saying is you don't always have to engage in this full bone process because it takes longer, costs more, particularly if you're going to do quantitative work, but cultivating a scenario oriented mindset, the unexpected unintended consequences, the what if is a valuable way to think about future planning because this includes looking at not only positive outcomes but negative ones, it's crucial that elected officials understand what you're doing because they typically want shining cities on hilltops in their plans, not gloomy management of decline, even if they ought to be thinking about the latter. When you're looking at trends, don't simply extrapolate current trends to create your baseline. Autonomous vehicles are going to happen to one degree or another. Um, climate change is likely to happen to one degree or another. So your baseline should incorporate what are really givens. It's crucial to test the logic and consistency of the scenarios. And in the end, you want to keep them relatively simple. So you can explain them and you can try and link cause and effect. Otherwise, it's hard to do that. And again, typically you want to choose a set of actions rather than simply locking yourself into a specific scenario. So let me move into the next phase of the presentation, which asks the question of these three approaches, what makes sense to apply when? Again, I've organized this question by how predictable the future is versus how much influence you have over it. If it's very unpredictable and you have a little influence over it, you really would want to be in exploratory mode to protect yourself and against all future options and also to develop a repertoire of strategies given these alternative outcomes. 
at the opposite end of the scale, if you have a very clear idea of what your future is in your context, and you can influence it for whatever reason, because of your control, it's safe to be in the predictive or end state mode. In the two remaining cells, it all depends on the specifics of your situation as to what kind of approach you would opt for. Let me slice the pie differently in the next slide. Here you have seven factors that all affect how you think about the future. Is your influence over the future on the left-hand side strong or weak? Is there strong consensus in the community on problems or are there no consensus? Is it a homogeneous or heterogeneous community and so on and so forth? Depending on your situation and where you find yourselves, any of these three approaches may be the appropriate ones. So, if you're towards the top of all of these in the green dots, predictive approaches where you're extrapolating and looking at trends is probably fine. If you're strong in some areas that count, but not sure in others, normative may be fine. However, if you're at the bottom of many or most or all of these, then you probably want to be in exploratory mode to understand and think about and plan for your future. So that's as much guidance that I'm covering in this presentation on what approaches to use. I want to segue to talk about tools. Here are the three scenario types, and each of them relates to families of tools. And I've characterized them as heavyweight on the left, lightweight in the middle related to normative, and middleweight related to exploratory. So on the heavyweight tool side, and they're called heavyweight because they generally are data hungry, complicated, expensive, require calibration, we're herding the data cat, the data rabbits here for Urbansim and Picus. Urbansim being the most used of these kinds of tools, both in the US and abroad now. Contrast with the agility, relative lower cost, less data hungry tools that are associated with the normative visioning kinds of scenarios, such as Envision Tomorrow Plus, ET Plus, Urban Footprint, Community Viz, and Geodesign Hub, which is less familiar, but an interesting tool. On the right-hand side, there actually are very few tools that really support exploratory work, and it's obvious why. This is thinking work, debating, conversation, testing, to generate and create the scenarios, certainly on the impacts side their tools, such as the Vision Eval tool, Impacts 2050, Geodesign Hub. The impacts generally are easy to deal with, but it's the construction of scenarios that I'm focusing on here. And in this middleweight range, there's not much to work with. So let me talk a little bit more about lightweight, since that's what most of you in local government will typically be using. But before I do that, the boundaries between these tools are blurring as they used in combination to set up a broad framework for the future using urban sim and then to test alternatives with ET plus, for example, as or urban footprint as SACOG has done in um, Sacramento. So these are moving targets. But the kinds of tools you may want to use depending depends in large measure on where in the planning process you are or want to be. So the eight, nine steps along the top of the slide in blue are the typical steps in a planning process. And in each of the lines below that, lightweight tools in dark green shows where these tools are strongest and the most help. So in this instance, those tools are good 
to build scenarios, to create other alternatives, and to assess impacts. That's where they excel. They do not excel, as the heavyweight tools do, in analyzing the current context and projecting baseline trends. The middleweight tools are very good in another spectrum of these steps, but not helpful in building your scenarios. So, moving into more specifics, but slicing the pie somewhat differently, let's look at ease of use of tools versus breadth of application defined as which of the seven actually should have been, I think eight or nine of the process steps you just saw in blue, which of those are covered by the tools. So that, for example, the agile lightweight tools such as Index, which is really no longer active, Envision Tomorrow and Urban Footprint are simple, relatively speaking, but they cover relatively few of the steps in the overall planning process. Communityverse is somewhat atypical because it does have a development allocation wizard, which actually allows you to base your judgment about future growth, not just on place types and selecting them in a charrette mode and putting them somewhere, but actually more rigorously defining what factors influence growth allocation and allocating accordingly. So community viz moves a little uh, differently in the spectrum. The complex tools in the top right do very well at a few of the steps, but not very helpful in the rest of the spectrum. Impacts 2050 and RSPM that I've alluded to in passing fall in an intermediate place in this whole spectrum. The combos of coupled complex models, such as the, such as the one behind Presto, um, can address many of the process steps, but require millions of dollars and five, six, seven years of development. Geodesign Hub is interesting because it's both simple and covers many steps of the process. Planners don't much know it, but landscape architects here and elsewhere in the world have used it extensively. Let me talk a little bit more about lightweight tools. So the standard process is what you see in the slide. Um, on the top right picture, you've got the community putting chips or place types on a map. Um, if you're moving down to the bottom right, you'll see it's in a large hall with tables using computers and, and a more mechanized software driven process perhaps which depends on place types which is what that little matrix shows you with pictures which have place types with trips they generate and mode splits they create and a whole lot of attributes associated with the palette of place types that are predefined that you can select from so the kinds of products here's a county plan for tennessee Rutherford County, with this is using community viz. Here's typical GIS driven community viz set of outcomes with existing and base case shown, and then two alternative urban form outcomes with some parameters described. Again, fairly typical application of this kind of a tool. These tools have not really been comparatively assessed much. About two years ago, I uh, led a team, as Michael mentioned at the beginning of the introduction, which actually try to assess these three popular tools against a whole series of attributes. This happens to be implementation attributes, one of many such pages in the report that is done in consumer report style, which summarizes um, an assessment of how different tools do against various attributes. So this is just an excerpt from this document, which which I think remains the only one of its kind, but it's now three years old since the work was done. So these are moving targets and not all of the judgments apply any longer. So these kinds of visioning tools have clear benefits, 
people learn about trade-offs, it's exciting, they mesh with each other, they get to appreciate other people's views, it's a good leveling experience for everybody, but the truth is these tools typically have limited theoretical foundations at the regional scale, where the dynamics are complex and hard for one subset of geographically based players to understand. So as you move up in scale, their credibility begins to be more suspect. Even though people love doing it, as we know, solutions are often infeasible. Everyone wants lots of clean industry and lots of jobs. Experts have to massage the output, your fingerprints get blurred, and the facilitators' activities and actions crucially affect the quality of the results. Oftentimes, these tools can overwhelm the process rather than serve it. It takes time and deliberation, and some tools tend to have a limited palette. They tend to direct outcomes, and the rules of thumb to drive indicators by necessity are quite blunt, resulting in some built-in bias. So these are all cautions and caveats that are worth noting. Um, and as tools evolve, they're getting better at addressing some of these issues. Let me just mention, which I did in passing, GeoDesign Hub, which is the only tool I know of that is structured to support collaborative processes in the exploratory mode or in even normative mode. What typically happens with most sketch tools is that within the model in green is what you see happening. Outside the model, unstructured, in debate and argument, you select place types, you tweak the scenarios, you debate the impacts, you tweak the inputs, and the staff in the end makes key decisions in creating the plan. Within Geodesign Hub, however, all of these processes are guided by the software itself. So everything in blue is managed by the tool itself in a one, two, or three-day charrette. And for the skeptics among you, I've participated in several Geodesign Hub charrettes, and the, the software is amazingly useful, in fact, in driving people towards an outcome. The last aspect of tools that I want to address has to do with scale and complexity. So at the local scale, where complexity is low, place types, lightweight tools, charrettes are the appropriate kinds of modes. At the regional, moderately complex situation, you want more than that. You want rule-based allocations, you want a series of workshops, maybe a task force, and at the state level, the complexity is typically such that you're into much larger, more complex tools and structures to work with um, futures. So these are all moving targets and changing, but I think as a general set of guidelines, this holds right now. Let me wrap by summarizing best tools as being determined by the audient purpose and context, is it insight versus problem solving? What type of scenario makes sense? And what's the scale of your application? And what kinds of tools are rapidly unfolding? So that wraps my presentation. And I think now we are ready to handle the huge barrage of questions that have massed on the organizers' tables. <laughs> Thank you, Uri. Yes, so throughout the webinar, we've been assembling the questions posed by our audience. We're now going to move into the question and answer session. You can continue to submit questions as we move into the discussion, and we'll answer as many as we can until about 2.30 uh, Eastern. So we'll now get started, and Uri is putting on um, his webcam so you can see him as we go ahead and do this. Um, so a couple questions here to begin, Uri, um, yeah. from earlier on in your presentation. First question is, a lot of these examples provide regional scenarios. Uh, do you have any good examples of city or smaller scale scenarios? Yes, good question. Um, 
and partly they're regional because that's who's done a lot of this work. Um, it's harder to find out who's doing local work. The Gwinnett case was a local one. Um, if you look for an impending publication by Lincoln Institute of Land Policy, um, should come out in the next several months. It focuses on, I think, six case studies that are all mostly local and focus on a charrette-based, non-quantitative, low-resource application of exploratory scenario work. Um, Suarita in New Mexico is one case in point. Denver is another. Um, the truth is it's hard to know who's doing what at the local level. Um, and in fact, if any of the listeners uh, have experience they want to share, a valuable function of this webinar would be to spread those around because researchers don't see them published. So I can't fully satisfy that question. In principle though, because you have local control, it's much more easy to be effective in scenario work at the local level than at the regional level. Okay, uh, someone asked if you could repeat that reference to the Lincoln Land Institute report. Sure, you know? sure. Um, so, gosh, uh, Lincoln Institute of Land Policy in Boston is about to publish a guidebook on exploratory scenario planning, XSP, and I don't know the exact title, um, but if you monitor that, um, the Sonoran Institute in Arizona teamed with Lincoln to produce it. Jeremy Stapleton at Sonoran is the primary author. So that's all the reference that's available right now. Okay, we can look for that, and if we can find that the specific link to it, we'll, we can add that to the um, website page. Thank you. Good, good. I guess a related question actually from the same person is uh, a lot of these scenarios deal with growth. Uh, what about the opposite? Uh, how does scenario plan for a community where growth is happening around it and it's therefore declining economically? Absolutely. And some of the scenarios I showed you explicitly looked at decline. Um, and in, in the case of Gwinnett, they in fact wouldn't let us look at some aspects of decline um, at all. It was too frightening to the elected officials. But it's the same kind of process um, you'd go through. Um, again, um, if you're looking for examples of work through scenarios of decline, I don't have any at hand. Um, you may want to look at the again, regional scale, ARC, Atlanta and Philadelphia examples, because they do deal with negative scenarios. And the whole Impacts 2040, which is part of a NCHRP publication, explicitly creates scenarios of decline. Um, so understanding the driving forces behind decline and the extent of sectors of the economy or sectors of the population that are affected is what the scenario process can help you with. It can also help you with thinking of ways to adjust, mitigate, and adapt. It's essentially a rigorous thought process, which can be modeled, that can help you decide where to put your investments. Um, in policy and budgetary terms. Um, so that's a fairly general answer to a specific question because I don't think we know a lot about examples. So as a follow-up to that, Uri, I mean, in some cases when we're dealing with communities that have a, maybe a politically viable set of scenarios, how, how do you work with them if, if you know that logically there's some others that probably should be evaluated and considered as well? Do, do you work with them to, to determine those on the outset and then, but if they don't want to look at them, do you still test them yourselves or how do you deal with that kind of circumstance? Good question. Um, I think you try and bracket and include plausible scenarios, whether they are negative or positive. If 
some of the scenarios are important, but not don't have the support of key stakeholders, you have to work with stakeholder groups to make them important. So if it's affordable housing, for example, that is a relevant issue in your jurisdiction, you may need to work with underrepresented groups who are stuck with the affordability problem, perhaps church groups, and in effect create coalitions through meetings, focus groups, surveys that support the importance of that scenario and raise it to the level of credibility and try and sell it to elected officials. Uh, surveys are often a useful neutral way of avoiding the usual suspects at public meetings who tell you what you already know. Um, but that is really one of the hurdles. The first hurdle though is convincing elected officials that the whole effort is worthwhile. If they don't understand it and have their support behind it, as I said earlier, it's a tough road to hoe. Um, so it's simply working away at the variables and the scenarios that are plausible and that dare not be ignored and selling it. And even if you can't analyze them quantitatively, retaining them qualitatively and their impacts in the plan itself, in the document, not buried in an appendix, but your plan should have a section that is front and front and foremost, which says, here's what we looked at, here's why we chose what we did, because in 10 years time, when someone updates the plan, that institutional memory will otherwise be lost. And that's the most valuable part of updating a plan, understanding why people did what they did 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. Okay, so as an approach, this is is quite advanced in in many areas. Um, do you find that it makes sense sometimes to maybe do a needs assessment or some kind of pre scenario planning before you might launch into this type of process? I think doing a SWOT analysis up front fairly quickly is a useful way to get a feel for the environment. As you know, in Florida, you used to be required to do that um, as a prequel to doing your plan update. So I think a SWOT analysis usually gives you the clues. Um, convening some focus groups up front will give you some clues as to what you need to do before you jump into it. Um, I have found that working with a task force of less than 30 people over the time period of the study or the plan be it a year or two years, is the most effective way to work with scenarios. At the very least, doing that as well as the typical outreach charrette-based stuff is necessary. That way, you have a core of educated stakeholders who are diverse and not all of a mind, who stay with the process, understand its details, may disagree, but in the end can be counted upon to partially support it or provide reasonable alternatives or dissension. And that's very helpful as a process too, working with a smallish representative task force, I have found to be the most effective way of doing this kind of work. Okay. Actually, one of the questions that came in, I think, is relevant to what you just said, and that is exploratory scenarios appear to, that they would take quite a bit of time to prepare and develop for a community or region. I wonder how would you keep people engaged in such a process? I think the observation is quite right. I think the process takes longer and is more complicated. Um, people enjoy the kind of scenario building speculation and discipline, particularly in the task force mode that we're talking about. Um, and being judicious about when you bring the public in so that they're not brought in in the sausage making data collection analysis phase but they brought in when you're ready to launch and describe the scenarios in draft form i.e four to six months into the process guarantees that they're not bored to death by the upfront work um thereafter i think it's the usual honing the message to make it interesting, honing the interactive websites or engagement process, uh, 
giving people opportunities online to vote for scenarios. There are lots of tools out there now that are very user friendly that give users the opportunity to engage and influence and present their position on scenarios. So there, there are any number of tools that have been developed commercially or customized to ensure that public engagement stays uh, fairly robust. But that's another reason that I prefer to work with the task force as well, because these are folks who deeply engage and usually stay with the process. Okay. Uh, one of our colleagues, Chuck Boyd, has a question for you. Um, are there examples of nested or incremental scenarios from a state level, then to a regional, and then to a local, or building on local scenarios to regional and ultimately at the state level? Interesting. Interesting. Um, you know, I don't know of any that run the gamut from local, regional, up to state, myself. Um, certainly, the direction usually is regional to local, so that Sacramento, SACOG would say that they generated a regional scenario and they've been working with locals to influence them, to buy into it and adjust their plans. That's the way the arrow usually works. It's from the region down to the locals using the bully pulpit. In the case of some states like Maryland, using financial incentives for infrastructure uh, as the stick to get people to buy in. Um, the same is true of the Utah experiment, the Wasatch uh, Valley. Um, you know, Envision Utah began 25 years ago and is still ongoing but they're usually fairly small contexts and fairly small populations um, that are involved where the regional and local distances and populations are not hugely separate. Um, but Chuck, I don't know of any local state up to the local region up to the state level efforts that have been tried. Um, Mega regions, yes. The Puget Sound region has done some work um, through the University of Washington um, UW uh, think tanks to look at mega regions. So I think mega regions is as far as we've gone, but typically they they don't look at all the impacts. It's typically transportation land use driven or environmentally driven around the Chesapeake Bay or something like that. So that is truly the bleeding edge. Okay, thank you. Um, another one of our colleagues, Jason Dubow, is gonna ask you a question. Uh, or yeah, I think one of the challenges uh, I would imagine is being able to convince decision makers that certain scenarios in the future are based on the best knowledge or forecasting possible of certain trends or certain um, feasible possible futures? Are there certain sources that a planner should go to to be able to prove or demonstrate that you are depending on a very robust um, analysis of what that future is likely to be? So there are increasingly, num increasingly large number of canned scenarios out there that have been developed over the last decade, I'd say, that are useful. I showed you the DVRPC scenarios that are really very thoroughly developed that have data on impacts of socioeconomic change, impacts of yeah. autonomous vehicles that you can crystallize and present to decision makers as evidence of impending problems. Robotization of work is the obvious impending threat that if you can present it in terms of fiscal and economic terms, will clearly grab your elected officials or should. So there are canned resources increasingly easily available. What I've often done is teamed on projects with local universities to get the benefit of academic research thrown in here to persuade elected officials about trends and their implications. So in Gwinnett, for example, we used uh, faculty from Georgia Tech, who in 2006 were beginning to notice all these foreclosures throughout Gwinnett County with no apparent reason um, other than um, the obvious ones, right? And we saw a very alarming trend 
in foreclosures well before the bubble burst. And because Gwinnett was home to several important and large local banks and lending institutions, we banged on the door of the elected officials saying, hey, something's going on here. We were going to look at economic and racial integration at the neighborhood scale and home ownership. Instead, we found a whole bunch of home ownership foreclosures, and this is a big deal. You need to pay attention. No one paid attention. Interesting. So um, you can do your best. Um, it's increasingly easy, though, to marshal arguments, and, and tapping academics is one good way to do it. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question is, you focused on regional land, land use planning, but there's more to planning than that. How else do you see scenario planning being used, particularly at the local level, for example, priority setting for budgeting? A absolutely. So I don't think the methodology is different. Um, at the watershed scale or looking at sewer extensions or at the sector and neighborhood scale, it gets easier and easier to do these kinds of things and to use these kinds of tools. Um, so the agile lightweight tools are most often applied at the sector or town scale. Um, so I think that the barriers, even if you're not quantifying or modeling them, are very low to this kind of thinking at the local level. Um, again, I don't think the methods change significantly, but the scale and detail gets to be different. Um, is that enough of an answer? Whoever asked the question, you can do a follow-up and see if you think I'm fudging and dodging. <laughs> okay, if, if we get another comment, uh, we'll share that with you. Um, another okay. question, um, any scenario work or tools that you might be able to note in the area of recovery and or resiliency from natural, from natural disasters at a local level? So, yeah, there are a whole family of tools that I've not even talked about that have to do with environmental disaster and recovery and hazardous material usage and forest clearance and environmental degradation. Um, I'm not very familiar with them. Um, but again, Lincoln Land Institute published, um, has published several good guidebooks in the last decade some of which deal with and document um, other tools. In fact, if you go to the Scenario Consortium website, and this is shared with APA on their, on their is a link to APA, there's a whole host of software tools, at least named and partially described, that go into these aspects. The problem is that they aren't typically linked to the scenario tools that I've described. Some of the tools I've described are getting increasingly good at tying in things like gentrification. So ET Plus has a gentrification module, for example, that was developed by Rob Goodspeed at the University of Michigan that says, given these characteristics, these areas are in danger of gentrification, and here are some things you need to think about. Same thing with fiscal impact and return on investment. Urban Footprint has a good return on investment module. Um, so there's some linkage there. It's the environmental impacts, hazardous climate change things that are really very complex and have not yet been reduced to sketch level tools. And that's a big hurdle. But um, again, I can't roll them off uh, my tongue, but they're fairly easily discoverable. Okay, thank you. Um, one of our former colleagues, uh, Ben Smith from Maine, has a question. I remember Ben. Uh, how much do you value um, attitudes, values or attitudes drive scenario creations versus data and analytics? They are equally important, they're equally essential. You have to combine values and attitudes with all your data crunching and, and analytics. Um, you can do that through surveys, you can do that through focus groups, but if you ignore them, your scenario work will be less valuable and less useful because in the end, 
grappling with values and attitudes, if it doesn't inform scenarios, leaves those scenarios unable to be processed politically because they're shorn of value connections to stakeholders. Elected officials want to know who will respond to these scenarios politically. So I would say to Ben that it's crucial. Okay. Um, in regard to your earlier question about examples, we did get someone who sent something in. I'll just read this for everyone. Uh, re and we can, if you want, uh, Alan Holt is the one who sent this in. If you want to email us with more information, we can share that as well. But regarding the scenario planning at the local level in Austin, Texas, we considered a district, 34 properties, 118 acres to evaluate the redevelopment trend, existing regulations and market and compared to two alternative scenarios one which came from an AIA ESTAT report and a second scenario from the University of Texas Urban Design Study. Through a HUD grant, these three scenarios were run through an ET model to compare a range of indicators. And through a grant, uh, John Freganese, uh, who passed away recently, oversaw the analysis. So he has a link to the report there. That's great, Alan. I'm familiar with the study and it's excellent work that Austin in particular has done around scenarios using ET plus for at least the last five years. It's probably the most evolved place that's used ET plus in this granular way. So that's a good, that's an excellent reference. They've in fact applied ET plus to zoning and zoning impacts in Austin as well at the local level. So there's a, that's a rich vein to mine. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thanks for responding to that. So if we do get the information on specific, we will go ahead and post that to the archive page. Or if Alan, if you have more information, you can send us directly. Uh, we can put that up there as well. I know Uri, you had uh, possibly uh, some additional information that you might have wanted to um, to take talks a little bit, no, not at the end here. Do we have a? I don't think so. No, okay. no. The, the the logistics of going to my slide to my spare slides and pulling them out at this point are daunting. Everyone's exhausted. <laughs> okay. Well, we have just uh, one or two more minutes here, so I'll ask one last question. Do you think that Esri has an archive of relevant existing decision-making principles, processes, and standards that would influence future policies? Wow. Are you familiar with that? Gosh. I I. I honestly don't know what Esri has by way of archived stuff. Um, I know they're working on this all the time. Um, again, I think a good resource is the APA Scenario Consortium links to what's out there. On that, on that uh, website, we've in the consortium also identified sample RFPs to solicit scenario projects from consultants. We've um, working on tools and making tools more interoperable, which is a big deal. Um, so I don't know if I don't know if Esri publicly lays this stuff out actually at all. If anyone listening knows, then it would be good to hear from you. But the truth is the vendors who are close to Esri uh, in the GIS world I know. of these tools are probably as expert as anyone else about what's in the wings. Okay. And if anybody does have any additional uh, examples that they'd like to share, if you want to go ahead and email them to us, email we will go ahead um, and post that and share that with Uri as well. So given the time here, Ori, thank you very much. We're going to conclude today's sure. webinar. Thank you. Uh, using scenarios for effective planning. I'd like to offer a big thank you to our presenter and to all of those who attended. The complete recording of today's webinar will be posted on smartgrowth.org later this week. When you exit from today's webinar, you'll be asked to participate in a short evaluation. Please take a few moments to provide feedback so we can continue to improve the webinar experience for you. Keep an eye on smartgrowth.org and our weekly e-newsletter for details on other future webinars, including one next Friday, September 27th at 1 p.m. Eastern, entitled Suburbs for Everyone, How to Rethink, Redesign, and Redevelop the Burbs to Be More Affordable and Livable with the Congress for the New Urbanism. Have a great day. Thank you very much.